Good morning, gentlemen. My name is James Tumsime, your moderator for this day. I'm joined by Ms. Nabasa Innocent, also your moderator for this day. Welcome to our pre-World Population Day e-dialogue supported by Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance, NTV Uganda, Reproductive Health Uganda, Reach a Hand Uganda, and World Population and National Population Council. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to have an e-dialogue on the pre-World Population Day event that is due on us on 11th of July this year. Every year as a country and as the world, we commemorate the International World Population Day to mark and check significant achievements, significant markers of progress in the lives of the people of the world. And in Uganda, we are having this event uh, coming up on 11th and it will be celebrated in Luengo. But before that event, we are having a team of experts here this uh, morning to share with us insights into what is happening in Uganda's population, especially in this time of COVID-19. Uh, the national theme this year is leveraging Uganda's population dynamics for a resilient future amidst COVID-19. And today's theme specifically is building Uganda's resilience, investing in young people's sexual and reproductive health. Well, there's something very special about this year's World Population Day, the lockdown. And as the Alliance, we have been advocating and calling upon the Ministry of Health to unlock the sexual reproductive health, especially for young people. If we want to attain uh, Uganda's demographic dividends, there is need to ensure that we invest in sexual reproductive health. But this is a unique year where no one anticipated uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are here to discuss to see how best amid the COVID-19 pandemic, can we make sure that the sexual reproductive health and rights of young people are not interfered with. We all know young people are the majority in this country. So if you are to achieve what you want to achieve, you have to invest in young people. You have to invest in their education. You have to invest in family planning. You have to invest in their sexual reproductive health. Now, in particular, I will take this opportunity to invite our national coordinator, uh, Mr. Charles Owekmeno, to introduce us to this e-dialogue on World Population Day. You're welcome, sir. Uh, greetings to you all, our viewers, viewers on NTV, viewers on UBC, viewers online, those who are listening to us, we welcome you all on board. Uh, my name is Charles Owekmeno. I work as the National Coordinator of the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda. The Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance Uganda is a consortium of major sexual reproductive health organization in the country. It has eight members as of now, but we work in partnership with all other sexual reproductive health organizations across the country. So the alliance is really founded to bring together all these partners so that we can have uniform voice, we can work together, and we can effectively engage our partners, we can effectively engage the young people to be able to bring out the sexual productive health and rights issues that affects them. Now, in about 48 hours from now, Uganda will be joining the rest of the world to commemorate the World Population Day. And many times people ask, why sexual reproductive health? Why sexual reproductive health all the time when we are talking about these issues? And the answer is very simple. Because sexual reproductive health determines everything about the type of population that a country will have. It determines the structure, it determines the quality, it determines the productivity, it also determines the growth rate of the population that we, you have as a country. So that's why there's a lot of focus on sexual reproductive health when we're talking about the population. The other thing that, why we thought that it's important for us to come together and reflect about sexual reproductive health and the population is that 
in this period, as a country, we have made a number of commitments. And now we have lockdown, we have COVID, and a lot of our priorities have shifted. If we do not get our priorities right, we have a risk of having reversals on all those targets. For example, the country has committed that by 2020, we would like to see the rate of teenage pregnancy reduced from 25 to 14%. If we reflect today, are we going to achieve that? The end of 2020 is just a few months away from now. The country has committed to eliminate and to end child marriage. If we reflect now, how far with, with that? The country has committed to reduce unmet needs for family planning to about 10% by 2022. How far are we? And all these have direct bearings on our population, on the quality of the population that we have, on the growth of our population, on the structure of our population. That's why we thought it's important for us to bring this panel together to reflect upon these issues and identify the key policy gaps that we can put together to the different government agencies for us to work together to address that. But also most importantly in this dialogue, we'd like to bring on, bo on board the voices of young people. They are the ones who are affected. We're having so many of them joining us online, but a few are joining the panel here, and they will be reflecting with us the realities that the young people are facing today. We all know that this country is the second youngest country, and that means that we have to prioritize the needs of the young people. And the biggest burden that they are carrying now is sexual reproductive health. And that's why during this dialogue, our panelists will be taking us through how we can embrace this and what are the things that government needs to prioritize. We have very dynamic panelists that has policymakers, that have development partners, that have young people. We are also happy to be joined by some religious leaders. We have media personalities and media We have civil society members, and we think that we will be able to have great deliberations and have clear recommendations to push forward to our policymakers and to the government. And as I conclude, whoever is joining us out there, we invite you not just to join and watch, but to also participate. You can share with us your comments, but most importantly, we would like you to know that amidst all this, as a country, we have to reflect strongly about sexual reproductive health of our young people. But even you as an individual, for example, you're a parent watching us there, are your children, are your boys and girls in charge? Do they know about their sexual reproductive health? That is the question that you, you should be reflecting about as you join us today. Otherwise, I welcome all of you, and I welcome our panels. Thank you so much for making time to be with us. I wish all of us a great deliberation, and as an alliance, we shall be taking whatever voices, whatever feedback that we get from here, forward and we shall engage the responsible entities. I wish you all the best of this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles, for those warm welcome remarks. We are social distancing at every perspective, as you can see. And this is a unique occasion for us to learn what is changing in the world. At this moment, allow me to ask the panelists at the front to each introduce themselves and relate themselves with the day's theme and purpose of the World Population Day. Thank you very much. Begin with Myra. Thank you so much, uh, James and Innocent. My name is Faith Myra, and I'm the Youth Country Coordinator of the Sexual Productive Health and Rights Alliance, Uganda. So today I sit here on behalf of all the young people that are able to view us today, but even those in the communities that are very rural that are not able to access TV or Facebook or data. So I'm here to present the views of young people in order to ensure that Uganda is building its resilience by investing in the sexual productive health of us as young people. Thank you. Okay, next on the panel. Thank you very much the chairpersons of, uh, of this uh, session. 
and uh, good morning viewers i would first of all want to say a very big, big thank you to those who are organizing this event thank you so much for bringing us together my name is betty chadondo and i am the director of family health at the national population council and i'm um, sure you all know the national population council we aim at ensuring that we have quality population. And in, with regard to the theme of today, and especially looking at resilience of young people, not only in COVID, for us, we want to take it as, even without COVID, we are looking at ensuring that the quality of Uganda's population is of really that kind of caliber that is competitive with the rest of the world. And uh, for the young people, we all know what their challenges are, as has already been emulated. And uh, the National Population Council will strive so much to bring out the pop national population policy that ensures that we incorporate issues of young people, issues of sexual reproductive health, issues of education, issues of skilling the youth, in order for this population to be the quality population that contributes to national development. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Henkian Bakker. I am the ambassador of the Netherlands to Uganda for two more weeks. Um, I am here from the perspective of a development partner, um, ready to share some experience uh, from the Netherlands, but also the work that we do in, uh, in Uganda and other countries and the focus that we have. Um, but I also always add that I uh, have also the perspective of a father of two young adults. Um, and so to me, this is always a, an issue that is very close to my heart because it concerns my own children as well. I sit here not only on behalf of uh, the Netherlands, but also on behalf of all the other EU member states, states uh, present in Uganda. We do a little bit of a division of labor among ourselves so they don't, we don't have to flock all of us to all the international days that uh, that, uh, that are on the calendar each year. And the Netherlands uh, traditionally have always done population and tourism. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. All protocol observed. My name is Agelo Sylvia, woman member of parliament representing Otuke district in the parliament of Uganda. I am here to talk about issues of reproductive health, the effects on our young people, especially when you look at the girl children of today, when you look at youth, they had been busy trying to do entrepreneurship activities in markets, in shops, but when you look at the shops that are not open, if I give example in Kam Kampala, the arcade, you find the young people are the majority who had been trying to make hands meet, especially those ones who had dropped out of schools. When you look at even those ones who are supposed to be at schools, the COVID-19 has brought issues of gender-based violence, girl children are getting pregnant. What can we do together? And as parliament, our target must be on the budget on how we can see issues of the target that we agreed upon. Thank you. Thank you. I would request uh, the assistant of him to take up the microphone. You could use a moving microphone. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Hindu Gloria. I have a disability. I'm deaf. So I'm here to represent young people with disabilities. Uh, I work as a peer educator under Richer Hand Uganda. And I'm also a reproductive health advocate for young people with disabilities. So I'm here today to talk about issues uh, that young people with disabilities face in regards to their sexual reproductive health issues. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Innocent, just help me to take the microphone to two more people. Uh, Jackson, 
and the right mufti. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Jackson Chekweko, the Executive Director for Reproductive Health Uganda. And I'm very proud to be associated with this panel uh, as we celebrate uh, World Population Day and as we focus on the future of Uganda, the young people, especially amidst COVID-19, which has impacted on the lives of everybody, but more specifically on young people. If there are people crying about uh, pregnancy, it is not the pregnancy among adults, it's the pregnancy among young people. And I think that's the more reason why we are here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sheikh Waiswa Muhammad Ali, the second deputy mufti, Uganda Muslim Supreme Council and an executive board member of the Interreligious Council of Uganda. We have been partnering on this program with the Minister of, Health, Minister of Health and Population Secretariat for quite some time. And we are privileged to be part of this discussion. Thank you very much, our dear distinguished panelists. The room is not so big, so everyone will get a chance to introduce themselves. But in the interest of time, I would love to draw attention to the theme of the day. And who better than Myra, I think the country coordinator for the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance. Myra, I have heard that you've gone east. And when you've gone east, you've talked to over 100 young people to try and establish the challenges that they are going through and the opportunities that they have in this uh, lockdown period. Do you want to share with us some of the first-hand information of the findings that you found in the East. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. Uh, like you said, uh, yes, I would tell more. The microphone, Myra. Thank you. Uh, like, thank you so much, James. And um, like you've said, the Sexual Productive Health and Rights Alliance supported the, the, the youth country coordinator, that's myself, and the president, to go out and beyond the social media engagements that we have been doing, as young people to ensure that we reach out information, to reach out to that young person that doesn't have a smartphone, that doesn't have TV, to be able to reach out to them and hear the issues. And uh, together we have put up an issue paper that I want to discuss with the room on how COVID-19 in particular has impacted on the access of SRHR information and services by adolescents and young people in these communities. So young people at national level uh, throughout Uganda have been facing enormous health and specifically sexual productive health challenges that have s had significant impact on their lives. I'm here to share with you highlights of the issues reported by young people on this assessment that was carried out particularly in Jinja, Iganga, Bugweri and Bujiri district. Um, from the assessment, we've had so many issues emerging but these really stood out. We have young people having a limited access to sexual reproductive health and rights commodities. And this is because most of these young people were accessing services like condoms, cyanopress, and painkillers from peers. Uh, the Alliance has a model that we call the community health entrepreneurs. And this was developed to ensure that we improve on the access to these services by the different young people in the communities. Looking at the Ugandan structure of how these health facilities are put, you'll find that young people have to move distances of about two kilometers, three to even five kilometers to access these services. So as an alliance, we came up with a model to ensure that these services are brought closer to the young people. But then with even this COVID-19 lockdown, these community health entrepreneurs have run out of commodities. So they are failing to reach these young people with services. One young person quoted, I, I am always approached by my peers for cyanopress, but I do not have it in stock anymore. However much I know that they're engaging in risky sexual behavior, I cannot help them. And this is a very concerned community health entrepreneur that has been extending these services to young people. Um, about 5% of our respondents have suffered effects of sexual and gender-based violence. It is evident from the emerging data from the Ugandan police that the, these cases are erupting 
But beyond the news, some of the respondents noted that some of their parents are very violent to each other, and this is especially to their mothers. This has adversely affected their well-being physically, but also mentally, without any sufficient psychosocial support at the nearby health centers. So one of the young persons quoted and said, schools were like our safe spaces, but now they are closed and we are stuck at home. So they are busy wondering what can they do as young people. Furthermore, so many young people ha have unanswered questions about their body changes and other reproductive health issues. This is a general breakdown in information. There is a general breakdown in information flow to young people on their growth and development, especially relating to health services. This is because there is a very abnormal trend of parents shying away from providing sexual, sexuality education to their children as they leave that role to the teachers. Unfortunately for now, schools are closed and these young people cannot access this sexuality education. They cannot access the basic information that they need to make these choices. And furthermore, when we look at the, the ban on public transport that has just been opened up a bit, if you go in the particular um, scenario of a rural community in Uganda like uh, Bugweri, you realize most of these young people use border borders to travel to health facilities to access uh, artery fields, to access different services. But there has been a ban to uh, reduce uh, as a measure against COVID-19 spread. So you realize that these young people can no longer move from the, whatever they say to this health facility. So they are, some of them are abandoning treatment, some of them are having different issues like that. So, but then we also look at issues um, young people have been empowered. Some of them have been empowered to be able to seek these services. But then there's a very impeding barrier, which is the close down on social and service corners for young people. And particularly, we visited a, health, uh, a youth corner at Bugembe Health Center 4, and this was closed. There were no safety measures in place. So how are young people? This is a, f a youth corner that's supposed to share information, that's supposed to access services. But when we look at these issues, you look at a youth corner with nothing, no IECs, no condoms, nothing particularly a young person will access. What is the future of this young person when you look at such scenarios? And we remember that before the lockdown, these young people are accessing such services from civil society organizations that would organize outreaches, that would go, uh, move door to door. But right now, this is impossible because there is a lockdown. We're trying to curb COVID-19. So that leaves uh, only the structures that the government has put in place to function to support these young people. But it's not working as we expect it to be. So um, I just want to bring another issue that stood out. There is a very raising, um, there's an issue on mental health challenges that is raising so much during the lockdown. Why? This is because most parents are prioritizing food and other basic needs than the menstrual materials needed by the adolescent girls and young women. Things like sanitary pads, painkillers, and needed psychosocial support is something that parents are not providing. As we are aware, all of us in this room, menstruation did not stop on the start of COVID-19. This pandemic will go on, but menstruation always happens every month. So what does it, uh, one girl quoted, my mother told me to start using local methods like torn clothes like she did in the past because there is no money to waste on sanitary pads. So sanitary pads has become some kind of luxury at this point that we are looking at it as a waste of money. Um, the general lack of income and employable skills by many young people. We all know that COVID-19 has led to a lot of loss of jobs, but then there are these young people that are adolescents that do not have any way to support themselves. And yet, more than 50% of them have echoed these needs that the government needs to stand out and economically empower them to enable them to support themselves and their young families. We're speaking about teen mothers. This is a mother at 14. What do you expect her to do with no sufficient education? So these are issues that are coming up. So one responded, quoted and said, as you educate us about sexual productive health and rights information and services, please kindly support us to run our own income generating activities. This is the only way that we're going to ensure that 
we sustain ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to conclude by saying, if, if at all we are to, that if at all we are to achieve a demographic dividend of this country, it is about the extent to which we are investing in the lives of young people. It's about the extent to which we're investing in their health. So if we are to build Uganda's resilience, we must prioritize in investing in young people's sexual reproductive health with aspects of economic empowerment. With that said, I would love to hand it over to the moderator and Thank you, Myra, for that elaborate presentation. I'll ask Hindu if she has anything to top up on this presentation at this time. Okay, so I want to say something small about uh, the challenges we've encountered as young people with disabilities. I would like to agree with my colleague. Uh, during this time of COVID, when they closed public transport, remember for us people with disabilities, especially young people with physical disabilities, some of them can't walk. So they use motorcycles and taxis and private cars. So there was a colleague of mine who was pregnant and she couldn't go to the hospital because there was no public transport. And the hospital is far. And then she had to crawl and crawl and crawl. And reaching the hospital, they say, the baby is almost losing the life. You know? You've delayed. Where have you been? But it wasn't her fault. And the way they were communicating with her, the hospital wasn't fair. Instead of helping her, they are condemning her, then telling her we are now focusing on only COVID patients, you should go back home. You know, it's been very challenging. This person has a visual impairment. How do you expect them to move without public transport? So it's been a very big challenge. And then for us who are, who are deaf, the biggest challenge has been communication. Yes, these safe corners are not there anymore in hospitals. The interpreters are not there anymore. Even when you go there, you can't access these services. You can't get family planning services. So the communication has been blocked. The transport is worse. So the situation is very challenging. There are so many issues, so many barriers. Communication. Transport, yes. And then the third is the negative attitude in these health centers. People don't want to work on us because we have disabilities. Yes, that's what's challenging. Thank you very much, uh, Hindu, for that addition. Just as I hand over to Innocent, it's important to also know that 12%, I think 12.5% of all Ugandans have some form of disability. So this is a very significant part of the population that we are talking about. Innocent, take on from here. Well, as uh, I picked a few things from uh, what the youth country coordinator, Faith Myra, talked about, uh, she said uh, schools have been a safe haven for these young people. Now, so what happens when these young people are at home and they do not have access to sexuality education, they do not have access to sexual reproductive health commodities, including painkillers, including pads, including condoms. Uh, let me give you a little bit of statistics. Um, Uganda ranks number 16 in uh, child marriage prevalence. That is quite big, that is global. 40% of girls in Uganda are married off by the age of 18, 40%. That is a very, very big percentage. And one out of 10 girls are married off by the age of 15. For those in rural areas, you will definitely agree with me that this is happening. So if their safe haven, which has been at school, is no more, what exactly is happening to these young people? Most of them are likely to be forced into early marriages. This is why government and development partners, I'm glad we have a member of parliament here, why you have to debate this in parliament and ensure that sexual reproductive health of young people is prioritized if we at attain Uganda's demographic dividends. Now, um, 
At this moment, I'll ask uh, someone to hand over the microphone to the Executive Director of Reproductive Health Uganda, Mr. Jackson uh, Chekweko, uh, right there. And I just have uh, a few questions for you. We all know Reproductive Health Uganda has been at the forefront of ensuring that young women, young people have access to sexual reproductive health services. Personally, I visited your facility in Iganga, and I was amazed by what is happening there. Young people are still going there, but I don't know, maybe some of the facilities have been uh, closed. So can you briefly tell us how this lockdown has constrained young people's access to sexual reproductive health services, including commodities and information? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Innocent. Uh, my name again is Jackson Chepweko uh, from Reproductive Health Uganda. Just as uh, my colleague Myra has uh, mentioned, under COVID, uh, the people who have suffered most are the young people in respect to sexual and reproductive health. Statistics have mentioned, the media has played this part to reveal what is going on on the ground. You talked about Iganga, and that's the region where uh, 60 young people were found to have unplanned pregnancy at the same time. It's amazing. So um, there are a number of challenges which COVID has come along with. Uh, one of it is that uh, the use of access has been seriously interrupted. Um, the young person with disability has been showing how challenging it has been for persons with disabilities. Those with physical impairment, those with hearing impairment, uh, just accessing the facility has been a challenge. But after easing of the lockdown, where transport has slightly been eased, the biggest challenge now is the cost of transport. Uh, because if you are using 5,000 or 10,000 to reach the facility before, now it has doubled. We are talking about young people who have been having economic constraints. There is stress at home. And uh, what about for the young person? It is even worse. And yet the same person is supposed to go to the facility. So that's one of the immediate challenges. The demand creation letting people to know that you can have access to services even during the lockdown has been heavily interfered because most of the discussions now is about COVID, COVID, COVID. No many people are out there telling people that yes, even under COVID, can you try as much as you can to reach the facility to access services. Now, sharing information about safe sex practices, about healthy relationships among young people has become a luxury because everybody is uh, under fear of COVID. But I want to challenge uh, the practitioners out there, including us, the civil society, but more particularly government, that this is the time that we should have a robust campaign. Uh, this is the time when we should have the Oblama to come back to save or to give information to the young people. Now, from the supply side, uh, we, we as Reproductive Health Uganda run clinics in all the sub-regions of Uganda. And in each clinic, there is a use corner. One of them is in Iganga. But when COVID, the lockdown was at this climax, the youth centers were ran out of business because the young people could not access the use corners or neither no amount of SOPs could work for the young people because these are, these are young people who will mix themselves. So you now consider whether to keep them away and safe from COVID or for them to come and access. But we as Reproductive Health Uganda have been reviewing that situation. We have put the SOPs in place, social distancing, the educational materials, sanitizing, and giving young people uh, masks. So we are encouraging them that starting soon, maybe from next week, we shall be starting our use corners so that we can allow young people to come. But we should also be having innovative ways of accessing young people where they are. We need to invest on the peer education program so that they get 
uh, protective gear and they are able to go with condoms to their fellow colleagues. Uh, we've been talking about Sayana Press, where a young person can put in her bag uh, and use it as and when the time has reached, such that we avert unplanned pregnancies. But there are also other worries which we have. We are talking about the current situation, but the Minister of Health is going to introduce uh, what they call one warehouse, one facility. And we have fears that this might even constrain access to commodities. Well, uh, that is just a tip of the issue. You said we have fears. If we have fears, what are recommendations you're giving to the Ministry of Health, to even uh, National Population Council, if they are focused on uh, uh, reducing the population growth in this country, but it's quite high. So maybe any recommendations in the policies that the members of parliament and National Population Council can take home? Yeah, I'm very excited that we have Honorable Slivia, who also doubles to be a member of the Board of Reproductive Health Uganda, and doubles as the Vice Chairperson for the Network of African Women Ministers and Parliamentarians in Parliament. We need money. We need money, and that money should go to young people. And uh, we are not talking something new. The president of this country himself committed this country in Nairobi during the ICBD plus 25, and said 10% of the Ministry of Health, Reproductive Health budget should go to adolescent health. We want to see this money. There is a division which has been opened, there is an assistant commissioner heading it, but we want to see that docket functional and have programs that educate the young people and facilitate commodities tailored to the young people. That's one. Number two, can we revisit in our strategies of COVID response? Let's hear the young people in those committees. They will speak for their own issues. Let the adults never assume that they will answer the issues of young people. Let's have in dist at district level, at national level, representation of the young people. The other one is we need players. I'm happy the Mufti is here. We need voices out there. We need to roll out the parenting guidelines. The parents are in a dilemma. The Minister of Gender has a parenting guideline which is suffering from dust not yet operated. So we need to operationalize this, but it requires uh, money. And districts should continue to allocate resources to family planning. But to our partner, I, I must uh, be very thankful to Ambassador Heng. Uh, he has been a champion of SRHR for young people. It's, uh, you are leaving, but go well where you are going. We, 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 we shall always remember you for the support for SRA. I know a number of programs has been uh, commissioned by uh, Netherlands Embassy, and some of them are targeting young people. We would ask the ambassador before he even leaves to see how those programs can be remodeled under COVID to address some of these unique challenges young people are facing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And yes, also a take home for the ambassador, Your Excellency, when you get there. Our appreciation to the Netherlands government. You've really been supportive in ensuring that the sexual productive health of young people is prioritized in this country. Honestly, we are grateful. And uh, thank you, uh, the executive director. You know, you've talked about the president's commitment while he was in Nairobi. I was personally there, and I remember him committing to operationalizing the sexuality education framework. Up to now, it's in the shelves. Uh, we don't even have the adolescent health policy. It has been a draft for how long? And even when it's still in the draft and going back and forth, it doesn't even uh, give young people access to some of these sexual reproductive health commodities. Even doesn't want young people, the adolescents, mm -hmm. to access some of these commodities. So also there's, there's still questions, especially now that we have teenage pregnancy at 25%. I doubt whether we shall be at 25% by end of 2020. Well, to you, my colleague James. Thank you, Innocent. Thank you, Jackson, for that very elaborate breakdown of the issues. You know, from what Myra mentioned earlier, there are some things which might have been missed. Myra mentioned about the issue of ART refills 
ART is antiretroviral treatment for young people who are living with HIV and adults actually who have run out of their stocks and they had nowhere to refill in this lockdown. Of course, this has very negative consequences for their health moving forward. Mayra mentioned the issue of cyanopress. Cyanopress is a contraceptive method that is self-injectable. You can use it on yourself, which were some of the commodities that young people and other community agents were distributing in the field. These have very significant effects on preserving the life uh, of the young people and other people in the community. So among the many things uh, Mayra also mentioned about menstrual health having become an issue of comparison, choosing between. Of course, you don't choose between mental health and anything. I mean, menstrual health and anything else. It is something that is there. You don't have a choice. And we just need a lot of information to make people understand that it is not an issue of choosing. It's an issue of doing everything in one's power to make sure that we attend to this. Uh, Jackson has also mentioned very critical issues around strengthening peer education, that is the community distribution, but also Jackson has asked for the money. You know, this is one of the hard things in every discussion, the money. When you can have all these nice ideas and when the discussion on the money begins, then our feet begin to coil. This time I'll bring around the ambassador himself, Ambassador Hank. Ambassador Hank. We are very appreciative of your time in Uganda for the last four years. I have had the liberty of, not the liberty, uh, I was privileged to travel next to Ambassador Hank in one of the planes, and he was so simple, honestly speaking. I'm sure he doesn't remember, but he was very simple. That was early this year. And he has brought the embassy very close to many people that we are even able to invite him into this space and he honors our invitation. Ambassador Hink, what motivates you and the Dutch government to remain interested into these population issues and the issues of young people at that? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I do remember. <laughs> you do, thank um, you. <laughs> um, uh, what motivates us to, to be active in this particular field of sexual and reproductive health and rights? Um, you can take uh, several angles. Let me, let me explore a few. One is um, uh, there's a human rights angle to this. Um, human rights are a, are a cornerstone of Dutch foreign policy and Dutch development policy. And sexual and reproductive rights are part of human rights. So. Uh, when we say that every girl, every woman, every boy as well, um, has the right to decide uh, over their own bodies, um, has the right to decide when to have sex, with whom to have sex, when to have children, uh, how many children uh, they are uh, choosing to have, that is uh, uh, in part a human rights issue. Uh, and in fact, it is ma mainly a human rights issue first and foremost. So from a human rights angle, we uh, are not only in Uganda, but worldwide, we, we promote sexual and reproductive health and rights um, of young people, boys and girls. So that's one part of it. Um, and, and we see that if you look at the, 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 the human rights angle, that there are still many issues that have already come to the table here and are, um, are, are need to be solved in, uh, in Uganda. Um, the other one, the other angle that I always emphasize is an economic angle. And I always split them up. There's the, the individual or household level, and there's the, the level of, uh, of the country. Um, when, you, when you discuss these things, you know, the, the teenage pregnancy, um, uh, child marriage, um, it is a waste of resources as well in the sense that these girls, especially girls, um, when they fall pregnant too young, um, when they have to raise a child when they are not yet ready for it, when they haven't been able to finish their education, whatever level they were supposed to, uh, to reach, um, it's a bit of a waste to society in a way that now at that very young age they need to go and take care of a child. Drop out of school in many cases either uh, because they can't afford it anymore or because of the, the stigma. Um, and the country will not benefit from the talents uh, that these uh, young people have. 
Um, and so from an economic point of view, I always say it's, it's, uh, you, you need to take that into account. It's wasteful. Um, the world population day, which, which is the reason why we are here, also look, looks at population growth. Uganda is the second fastest growing population in the world. Um, only Niger uh, has, a, has a higher rate. Today we have 43 million Ugandans. In 2040 we'll have about 80 million Ugandans. It will double in the next uh, 20 odd years, the population size. And again, what I say is, can the country afford all these people? Do you have the health facilities? Uh, do you have the schools? Can you train the teachers that need to uh, that you need in order to make these uh, all these young people um, productive citizens of these of this country and I think that's a very very difficult challenge we always talk about the the, the dividend the population dividend but um, the dividend is only there if some of the other parameters are in place and education and health are definitely uh, part of that so um, uh, from that perspective, uh, we, also, we also look at the country as a whole and say, does it make economic sense? Uh, and sexual and rec reproductive health and rights are a very important element in that. If you are ignorant about these issues, if you don't know what your body does, um, you will much easier fall pregnant too young and you will f much easier fall into that poverty trap that goes with it. Um, so from the, that perspective, I always look at it at, uh, from an economic uh, point as well. Um, let me say a few things about, about COVID um, because it is sort of the, the elephant in the room here. It is not on the agenda, but everybody talks about it. Um, Uganda has been extremely successful in, in trying to prevent COVID from spreading in, in the country. In fact, it is probably one of the most successful countries in Africa and possibly in the world in that sense. If you are at this point in time still below 1,000 cases of which the large majority have recovered, if you haven't recorded a single death, um, as I asked the other day and, and to my knowledge, nobody has been in intensive care yet. Um, you, have, uh, you have been very successful in preventing uh, the, the virus from reaching uh, Uganda. And when I explained this to my minister not so long ago, she asked, how reliable are these statistics? And I said, they are reliable. This is what it is. This is the situation. Do they catch 100% of all cases? Maybe not. But it, it does give an accurate picture of the situation in the country. Um, economically, Uganda is also doing relatively well compared to other countries as a result of the COVID crisis. The economic growth for fiscal year 1920, so 2019, 2020, will still be uh, around 3% according to IMF and next year it will be roughly the same or maybe a little bit uh, higher even. Many countries go into recession, including my own. We will, in the Netherlands, have uh, a minus between 5 and 7 percent uh, economic growth in 2020. So there's a huge difference here. So the figures are good. Um, and the approach has been very successful and very good. But when you listen to the stories, Myra, Gloria, and others, of what happens below the surface, what it means for individuals, young people, um, looking for uh, a way to, to have an income or to, or to keep their income, looking for ways to indeed get those sexual and reproductive uh, health uh, services and rights. Um, it paints a little bit of a different story and it is uh, uh, very, very difficult. And it has uh, severe consequences on the population of Uganda. We have to be very careful that under the surface, we are not creating another crisis, that we successfully deal with the COVID, but that uh, in the meantime, we neglect other areas and that we will have uh, negative consequences in those, uh, in those areas. And so it is very important that we continue as a development partner to do what we do. Um, I hear you, Jackson, when you say, first and foremost, we need money. Um, 
in that same conversation that I had with my minister, um, we were discussing um, changing programs to make them COVID relevant. And at some point I said in that discussion, um, we have to be a little bit careful here uh, to jump the gun. Let's, let's not be too wild about this because everything that we do in Uganda, whether it's on SRHR, whether it's on food security, whether it's on, on uh, the business community, um, is COVID relevant, relevant because it provides income to people, because it provides the services that uh, young people need in when, I, when we're talking about SRHR. So if we can manage to continue to do what we do, we are already doing something very important, is my plea. Um, and I need to, uh, when you say, uh, you know, we need more money, uh, as I said, my own country is going into a deep recession um, we will have a, a budget deficit in 2020 that is predicted to be 68 billion euros. That is two and a half times the size of the Ugandan economy. 68 billion euros budget deficit. And so um, we are fighting very hard um, to not only keep the Dutch economy going and to put government money into the economy to keep it, keep it running and to, to to, uh, to limit uh, the, the, the consequences of the recession. But our argument is also the same is happening in all these other countries as well, in these countries where we have a development program. So we need to keep our bu development budgets at the level where they are today. That is a battle if you have 68 billion deficit. But we are fighting that battle and we are trying to keep that money uh, available. So I'm hoping, uh, Jackson, that uh, not me because I'm leaving soon, but that my successor will be able to say to you at some point in time, uh, yes, we will continue to do uh, what we have been doing in the, in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Baker. Wow, that is deep, right? losing 68 billion due to recession, but also for observing that uh, we having managed COVID at the top level very successfully, but that the human life is really not at that level for the ordinary people that are making up this success. And I think to us that is a very clear communication to our government representatives in the room. Our religious leaders have begun to cry this out very clearly. We've had it to the extent that some are putting on different wear one of these days. But to say that uh, there is a need to focus on the human index, the lives of the ordinary people that are making up this very well articulated success. Reverend, I mean, Ambassador Baker, later on I'll come back to you and I'll ask you to reflect on your four years in Uganda and what are those critical things that you think could be done different. Really, this is about... Uh, Andrew Mwenda normally calls it the old man of the clan, having served in this country for four years and having a comparison to make with other countries of the world. What are those landmark things that you'd want to speak about uh, as we, we transit? I will come back to you on that. I think I'll ask you to take over. Thank you, James. And uh, the... Um Excuse me. And the ambassador's uh, presentation has uh, really brought the reality uh, back to me. And uh, remembering that uh, Uganda's vision uh, 2040 talks about uh, uh, attaining the upper middle income economy by 2032. We were supposed to, the projection was to have a lower middle income economy by 2017. We all know what happened. We didn't get that. But also we need to know that to attain the upper middle income economy that we need, there is need to invest in the sexual reproductive health and rights of young people. When you do that, you will control the birth rate and you will employ more youths and the pressure that is being put on resources will be reduced. In particular, even the environment. The more we give birth, the more pressure we are putting on our environment, the more competition for resources, climate change is having a very, very big impact on us. So we need also when you invest in the sexual reproductive health of young people, you're going to reduce the dependency level, and uh, you're going to reduce the number of children who are more dependent, and you're going to have more young people who are active, who are energetic, who can contribute uh, reliably or can contribute to the economic growth of this country. So those are some of the things that I've picked uh, from the ambassador's uh, uh, presentation. Also to know that uh, 13 
43% is youth unemployment in this country. We have 43 million Ugandans. So really you see that is uh, quite uh, a serious challenge. And the dependency level in Uganda is 103%, 103%. That the disadvantage with developing countries, the dependency level is from young people. With developed country uh, is, is uh, rather is from uh, both the old people and the young people. Most of us are taking care of our parents. So that is why our dependency level has shot way above. The fertility rate in this country is at 5.4 children per woman. 5.4 children per woman, that's very, very high. All the women here, imagine you have 5.4 children. So really we need to invest in family planning. We need to invest in access to family planning for all women and men that are in need of it. At this moment, as I talk about those statistics, and I know um, National Population Council also looks at Vision uh, 2040. You also want to achieve Vision 2040, but how are you going to achieve it when we still have these, <laughs> these challenges? The fertility rate in this country is quite high. So going to you, Dr. Betty Chadondo, the Director of uh, Family Health at National Population Council. So. Uh, Despite the challenges that we are having, the high dependency ratio going to <laughs> 103, I know there's still potential for improving the population, for improving the challenges that young people are facing. Can you tell us what uh, National Population Council has put in place to reduce mainly the high fertility rates, the pressure on the resources, and also the dependency level? Thank you very much, Innocent, and once again, thank you, uh, the organizers of this event. As a National Population Council, I'm sure you've been hearing what we are doing, and uh, I was very, very impressed uh, by all the speakers uh, that have spoken before me and what they are bringing out on table, because this is the gist of uh, the work that we do as a National Population Council. I just want to correct one thing, Innocent. Uh, attaining Vision 2040 is for all of us. It is not only for the National <laughs> Population Council. And uh, if we are going to attain Vision 2040, each one has a role to play. Each Ugandan who is watching what I'm saying has a very big role to play as an individual, as families, as societies, as communities, and as a nation. The members of parliament have a role to play the teachers, I'm very, very happy that Mufti is amongst us and is already supporting the population program. The religious leaders have a big toll on this. The, uh, our cultural institutions have a big role to play because what we are looking at today, where are the challenges of the young people? Some of them are societal. We have made ourselves believe that marrying off our girls early it's the right thing to do, but is it the right thing to do to marry off my, I have a 15 year old daughter, by the way. So if she got married, how would I feel? So, but society has accepted that. And some of, uh, of the ways that uh, these girls get married, it's because we are poor. You will give your daughter away for only a few, I don't know whether it is goats or a few Ugandan shillings. And this is a very big challenge. So what we are doing as a National Population Council, we have realized that if we continue speaking about sexual reproductive health alone, without considering sexual reproductive health in the context of development, we are losing it. And uh, Jackson mentioned in his, um, when he was giving us his speech, that uh, at the Nairobi summit, his Excellency the President committed this country. He did not commit himself, but he committed this country that we are going to do certain things differently. And that is now we are rallying behind this commitment that he has made. As a National Population Council, therefore, we have developed what we call the roadmap for helping this country harness the demographic dividend. The me demographic dividend, if I can explain it, is an economic benefit. It is a bonus. You only get it when you have invested in certain areas, in certain programs, in certain policies as a country. So there are five things that we want to do as a country. Number one, we are all aware that Uganda is one of the fastest growing. It is number two, 
I always thought we are number three in Yemen and Niger being number one and two. But uh, if we are number two, then we are even retrogressing. So we have a very huge young population. The population of Uganda has majority of its people below 15 years. And this gives us about half of our population is below, fif is below 15 years. So 50% of Ugandans are young. 76% of Ugandans are within the youthful population, those that are young and those that are youth. So 76% of Ugandans are below 30 years. There are two things that this means. One, we have people who are energetic, people who are innovative, people who are thinking, who can make transformation for this country. Number two, have we invested well enough in these young people to be able to give us that force that is going to propel us to harness the demographic dividend, that are going to be able to propel us to transform the country so that we attain Vision 2040. So what we are doing is we want to change this population age structure. We want to ensure that slowly and over time, we have more people who are going to contribute to economic growth of this country by increasing the number of people who are beyond 15 years so that we reduce the number of people who are below 15 years. It is not easy, ladies and gentlemen, except if we embrace some of the programs that we are looking at. One of them is we have to ensure that we embrace family planning as a program. And this program, we embrace it as an investment. There is no way we are going to change our population age structure and ensure that we have fewer young people and have more people in the working age population. Why is this important? In economics, and I'm very glad that the ambassador emphasized some of these points. In economy, we look at two things. We look at people who are producing and contributing to the growth of our economy, but we also look at people who are consuming and reducing what would have helped us to invest and save. So if we have young people, these are consuming what those who are working are producing. So why we need to transform this age structure is to have more producers who will be in the working age bracket and have fewer people consuming. Because if we don't, if we have more consumers, then we are not making any savings as producers. We cannot even invest anything for the growth of the economy of our country. So we really must change this population age structure and ensure that we have more producers, fewer consumers. And that can only happen if we invest well enough and ensure that family planning is embraced not only by adults, but also the young people. And this is the gist of our discussion this morning. Number two, we have to ensure that these young people, as they grow, they are in school, but they are also getting skills to be able to contribute to the labor productivity of a country. And uh, the government has uh, looked at this and they have considered skilling Uganda, which you all hear about. They have invested in having uh, technical and vocational institutions established. We have a challenge as Ugandans. We have a mindset that tells us if you haven't gone to university, then you're not educated. I think we have to speak to our people that the skill that you get can push you too far. You don't all have to be university graduates for you to be able to put food on your table. And for as long as we don't change this, it is impacting on the growth of our economy. Number three, we need to ensure that as the people who are giving birth continue giving birth, they should be able to take care of the children that they are giving birth to. One of the challenges that we have as society, I may want to have four or five children as a mother, or as a couple we discuss that yes, we want to have four children, but then we think critically, but what if one or two of our children die? Then we have to give the number of children that will compensate for those that are likely to die before they grow up to become adults, which is a challenge. But if we assure this community of Ugandans that with good immunization, with good nutrition, with uh, good access to health services, even when a child gets sick, 
they will be able to get urgent treatment and the children will survive. The immunization program has impacted very well to improving um, maternal, sorry, infant mortality. Infant mortality rate is one of the indicators that we are very proud of as, this, as a country. And one of the reasons why it has played out so well and with all due respect to Ministry of Health and the work that they have invested in immunization, we have achieved uh, the targets. We have actually gone beyond the target that we set for uh, infant mortality rate. But the challenge is with uh, that mindset of children are going to die. So I'll have six instead of having four, and that is a challenge. But we need to assure couples and women especially that when they are want to have four children, let them have four, they will survive. And this is changing. We are seeing it. It is one of the landmarks that we have created and we are very, very proud of. The other thing that we need to do for this country, whereas we are educating our children, can we also make them remember that as you grow, you need economic empowerment. Income generating activities are key. Many of our children, even graduates, are sitting at home waiting for jobs to find them in their homes. There are so many things that we can do innovatively as young people because we have our energy, we have our brains to think, we have to throw our nets even wider, but we are not doing them. There are enterprising um, centers that have been created. There are so many that we can do that g can give us an income. And if we don't convince these young people that there is income for them waiting somewhere, then they cannot do much. It is very unfortunate, ladies and gentlemen, that COVID-19 has impacted very grossly on most of these different areas that we are discussing, as we have heard from the, uh, the studies that have been conducted, but also as we are reading across the globe. So if we cannot access services, the young people cannot get family planning, the Gutmacher Institute has given us and has shown us that in Uganda, the biggest challenge that has come to their you know, revelation is that most of the Ugandan girls get pregnant when they are not ready. So they have unintended pregnancies. Taking care of unintended pregnancy for this young girl, because you know they don't even want the pregnancy to show, which is very difficult, so they don't access services, they will not attend antenatal. By the time they get to delivery, they have developed complications. Some of them resort to undertaking abortions. They get complications from abortions. They go late to seek for abortion care services. And by the time they get there, the cost is even wider than what would have been considered if they went to seek for antenatal care, if they delivered in health facilities. You know, the complications become more costly than the actual cost that would be involved in seeking antenatal care. So ladies and gentlemen, I can speak so much about this and no one has told me to stop or continue. I <laughs> so think we should tell you <laughs> to stop, stop now. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much, Dr. Chadondo. You know, talking about a dividend is an interesting thing. A dividend is a profit, right? In a different language. A it's a benefit. You don't want to call it a profit. But in the money language, a dividend only comes after you have invested. So the investment now is to put family planning, let the girls go to school, finish school, and come and be a Dr. Chadondo here. I am sure she's a dividend to her family, both her maternal family, where she came from and where she went, because she went through the ladder, right? So it's important to support our girls to become part of the dividend. I will at this moment go right to the Honorable Akelo, who is a member of the Board of Reproductive Health Uganda, but also a member of the Network of Women Parliamentarians of Africa, who is a key champion of the girl child. Honorable, you've been part of this. You've watched the news. You've seen the ugly scenes that have happened over this uh, COVID period. In your seat as a member of parliament, what are you doing about it? Thank you very much as a member of parliament, as a mother, as a person who went through those issues the rural girl children are going through, I see pain. 
uh, as Parliament of Uganda, we had been thinking of uh, development activities for our young people. That is why there were so many activities that they were doing to make sure they earn a living. But unfortunately, most of the shops, most of the activities have closed down. When you see young people trying to put together to make phones from Uganda, other young people are trying to make vehicles in Uganda. These were the initiatives of the young people, as our country is ma majority of the population are young people. However, all this has been shattered completely. When you see the shopping malls that have been open, it is not for the young people. They can't afford to rent such kind of places. The Chikubos, the Mutasa Caferos are the places where they would be working. But now they are not doing it. So the presidential initiative is on pipeline right now on uh, what the, the, the move in, in, called in Mioga. They are moving in all the districts, registering and trying to see a way of giving funds to the young people. And if unfortunately you are not aware, you have to get yourself to either a community development officer and see that you also benefit such that we prepare ourselves as the result of the aftermath when everything has come out. So all this I'm talking about on how can we join our hands together to make sure we empower our young people economically. I want to thank Dr. She clearly mentioned that we have to think outside box, not only to wait for the white collar jobs, but we also need to look for people to identify this kind of empowerment. You can't expect a young child or any other young children to continuously think outside box and come up with the answers. The reason why we have career guiders is to try to tell you if you follow this path, you will go the other side. But if we just leave young people to continue thinking, for how long shall they think? So it is you and me to also try to guide these young people on this empowerment that we are talking about. Otherwise, they may start inventing something that would again be disastrous to our country. Secondly, I want to talk about the issues of education. Yes, this COVID, the lockdown, has made even the temperature of working hard for the young person gone too low because where can you go? What means of transport will you use? How can you even share idea with your friend? By the time you are walking to town and coming back, the, the curfew time will catch up with you and the LDUs will not believe you are just walking on foot and you don't have any better means. So this one has actually brought insecurity in the lives of the young people more. So as the country, as parliament, we need to see a way of making sure the young people are not insecure psychologically on how they can go and then get ideas of how to implement. Secondly, still on education, the girl children go for water. We know very well that we are emphasizing the regulations from the Ministry of Health. It's telling each and every person to wash hands. But in rural areas, where are you going to get water for washing hands? You have to move a distance to, to fetch water either from the well or from, from a borehole. By the time you are coming back, how secure are you that you will reach home safely? So all these are some of the challenges that results to forceful rape and then pregnancies by young girls. When you go, there are too many girl children getting pregnant. And all these, some of them were at school. So as education ministry thinking of opening school, what must we do outside box? We should allow even pregnant girls to go and continue with education. They shouldn't allow to remain home simply because they are pregnant. Some of them have not even accepted the pregnancy during this lockdown time. So in as far as young girl is concerned, I believe getting pregnant must not be the end of someone's education. We must encourage them 
we must support them and we must see to it that they continue with their education so that they become another doctor, they become another honorable member, and I don't remain for life on this seat. Um, thank you very much. I also want to say as, as Uganda, it's not only parliament, but everyone. We know the role of the religious institutions. We know the role of the cultural institutions. We know the role of parents. But one of these days I see that it is becoming difficult for parents to manage children. As we think of opening the lockdown, I hear Kenya has already started the issues of prayers, although there are also regulations you are supposed not to be more than 100 in the church. Uh, the religious institution should also look into a way of slotting in how they can handle the, the, the result of the COVID, especially to the young ones. What are you going to tell them? How are you going to really mentor and psychologically let them come out of this? The cultural institution, are we still thinking the way we had been thinking? Oh, we have to, again, put another thing to make sure we talk to the girl children and we help government, we help parliament to accomplish the commitment of the Nairobi summit. As the doctor said, it is not only parliament, it is me and you to make sure the commitment is accomplished. Uh, I, on the issue of parliament, we have laws, we have bills that are seen to be shelved. But I want to say, when you look at the time of legislation as of now, we enter plenary by two and by five you are supposed to go. So we've lost a lot of time. However, I want to appreciate the Speaker of Parliament. She's one of the champion. It's just a matter of reaching to her and we tell her, let's prioritize A, B, C, D. She has never let us down. And um, I believe we shall do everything to make sure those bills come out. We shall make sure we remind the Ministry of Health on their part of giving the 10% of their budget on issues of reproductive health and family planning commodities. Now that there is contributions everywhere on COVID-19, the other donors are giving us support what about the issue of the commitment of the 10 percent? The National COVID group should not forget about this. They should remember it. Before we went for lockdown, Honorable Amoding brought the bill on the issues of menstruation. And she said menstruation is here, menstruation is now. When, wherever you see anybody who is a woman below 49, expect menstruation because there are no specific date for you to say it starts from 25th to 30th. It may be there on 3rd, it may be there on 4th, it may be there on... So menstruation is here and it is going nowhere. So all these are some of the, some of the jingles that we need to put across to amplify so that as government, as civil society organizations, as religious institutions, as cultural institutions, we don't only think of food, but we also think of a girl child who is menstruating so that the mind and the psychological torture that comes with menstruation when you are not well prepared goes up for a girl child to think positively for the development of this country. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Honorable Akelo. I think that was spot on. And I like the fact that you've addressed yourself to issues that are very pertinent to the girl child but are endearing and not about to end. They are long-term processes, not events. At this moment, I would love to, of course, like I've mentioned earlier, welcome the Deputy Mufti, who also doubles to be part of the top leadership of the Interreligious Council. You're welcome, sir. I would love to really come straight to you at this point. You know, with all the challenges that have happened, we know that religious settings have been one of the most important modeling places for our children. And now services are running through the media, through TV, through radio, and not many young people have these means within their own space. What 
are you able to do differently to continue with the modeling that has traditionally been associated with the religious institutions at this time? It's on, it's on. It's on. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I also beg to follow my predecess predecessors in thanking the organizers of this. Well, as a religious fraternity, we indeed know that God expects us to be responsible to take care of our families. And in that regard, we should have children that we can be able to take care of. And uh, also, in that direction, we should be able to have a well-guided youth. So our major and prime goal is really in promoting healthy living and quality lives. In that perspective, we require to position ourselves as leaders. We need to position ourselves very well so that we achieve the future we want. We should not keep a blind eye on what is happening as if we do not see it. We practically need to have to come out with practical solutions. We must, if we are to achieve the goal, use our positions as leaders to mobilize and sensitize and advocate as well as promoting the services that benefit the youth in particular and the entire society as to avoid the spirit of misuse of resources. Sometimes you hear people complaining about resources when actually a lot has been done in finding the resources to address this subject but have equally been misused. So we should be able to take care of ourselves. We need to strengthen community systems around us and strengthen meaningful involvement of leaders. Of course, here we thank our partners who have on several occasions been able to build capacity of religious leaders in particular in the way of rendering the service in connection to the youth and young children. Because leaders are change agents and community gatekeepers. Therefore, they have to get effectively involved in so doing. Also, so social economic transformation. When we look at the entire situation, we see that transformation is a prerequisite for human growth and development. It therefore calls us all to be actively involved and employ strategies that can change the mindset and attitudes of not only the youth, but uh, the entire population. So many of us have misconceptions, a lot of them. We have uh, the way we look at things and translate them. But ideally, as we are running through the COVID effect, our responsibilities have doubled. We have actually learned more lessons from COVID than ever before. Parents have been leaving children only to the school care. And you know, most of the time children spend in schools. But COVID has compelled us to have our children home. Things have been happening differently. 
we see parents who lack the capacity to advise their children, which means that even the parents require capacity building. As we progress in this, we should not put aside the parents. We need to involve them equally because not many of them really are responsible. Unfortunately, we have we have ch child mothers. We have parents who are children. We have that in our midst. How are we to go about that? So indeed, there is no way we can avoid that if we do not take seriously the question of planning for our families. When people talk about planning, some people have misconceptions that we are driving towards killing souls. No, we are not to kill souls. We are protecting souls. In fact, our major aim is to promote life. You should not give birth to those whom you will kill. This today, this morning, I, I read through Bukedu, and I thought I came with a paper where there was a story of the heightening number of abortion. And many women who are dying through the COVID and the increasing level of teenage pregnancies because of the COVID. So all this need to be brought about to promote the awareness and understanding of everybody, all the stakeholders, because these happenings are not happening from strangers. Some of them are happening from the relatives of the children. They are incest already. There are a lot that is happening which is putting us really out of the order. Therefore, as uh, religious leaders, we invite for our leaders in government and in parliament. We thank them for the role they have played. Actually, they have done a lot, but the implementation of policies is still missing out. There are policies that have been put, that have been suggested, that have been shelved, as the Honorable puts it. We need all this. Wow. And the welfare of our children need to be looked at seriously. Because we already have the numbers, but many of these, are, many of these ones are left on the streets. They uh, have the title of street children, and we have that one here recognized as a title. We need to, t to be serious about this. We need to increase the welfare. We need to think much about it. And then let us involve the youth themselves in resolving their problems. It should not be with the adults only to always be presuming taking role of improving their fate. Let them be also involved and be trained to act as agents of change. Thank you wow. very much, uh, the right honorable. Sorry about I'll that. shake uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm sorry about that. Wow. I'm struggling. Uh, yes. He talked like an, an honorable. I, I just wanted I, to I put a lead politics. question to him. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, hearing you speak, you speak so different and you speak in a language that resonates with the language from NPC, the National Population Council. What is it that we can do different as the people mainly on this side that are speaking the same language to make sure that many of the religious leaders in your place can appreciate some of these issues the way that you do? Well, the issue is about capacity building. Uh, we have been trying, but our means are minimal. And that's why we, we call upon our partners to increase in the support to build capacity of our leaders, religious leaders. So that's the issue that is missing out and it's a gap. Because if we need them to, s to see things the way we see them, 
they need to be brought to the platform to be able to realize and see them. And also we have a problem that uh, in a religion, we don't have a safeguard and empowerment to be able to presume our authority and control. Every other day you'll hear about a breakaway faction. And this breakaway faction, government will license it happily. And we are wondering, to what extent shall we go that way? Where somehow you see in those factions not behaving well or misusing the population or leaving the order. We hope that government should really re reconsider the aspect of registering new factions that are break away from the mainstreams of faith. Really, I know it calls for some reformation within the faith itself, but it does not promote division again does not allow us to be divided again, to be broken down, because that one is increase, increasing what you are saying, whereby we see some religious people who are misbehaving in handling serious issues like these ones. Thank you very much, uh, the Mufti. I think there's a lot of learning from this meeting, but before I allow Innocent to take over, I'll go back to my promise that I made earlier to the ambassador. Ambassador Henk, I am back. You remember our homework? Here we go. Well, to start, um, just two days ago I was um, at the launch of the, the UNDP Youth for Business uh, program, and there I learned a new term. Um, it was senior youth. <laughs> And, um, and I said I will refer to my, myself until the end of my days as a senior youth. Now you're calling me out as the old man of the clan. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where that puts me. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not quite sure what I prefer. Maybe the first uh, rather than the senior second. Senior youth will do. Senior youth is, uh, has, has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Um, we are young, we're all young at heart uh, in the end. Um, uh, when I look back, <coughs> Uh, at my time in, in Uganda and what, what, what do I take and, 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 and what are my lessons and what are the lessons for the country. I think, I think I'll just refer to the conversation we are having here. And what inspires me in Uganda is that there are so many wonderful people, whether they are in government, whether they are in uh, civil society, whether they are religious leaders who are inspirational, who are dedicated, uh, who want to do something good for their for their country, um, and and that I think is one of the very uh, big strengths of this uh, of of Uganda. Uh, the Mufti is absolutely right is uh, in in when he says that implementation is very often where it lacks. <coughs> Uganda has wonderful policies. In fact, if Uganda would implement all its policies, I sometimes make a joke. It would be the Switzerland of of Africa. Um, so maybe you need a minister of implementation um, <laughs> uh, among, among, uh, among some of the ministers that you have. It might, it might add uh, a value to the, to the government programs. Um, but the policies are there and the thinking is there and I think, I think in that sense there's a, there's a, there can be great progress. As for myself, um, you may have seen this morning I was on the front page of New Vision um, with, uh, uh, with my farewell of the New Vision team. Yes, um, I watched it on TV yesterday. Uh, and and um, they gave me a nice cartoon of myself carrying a Matoke bunch. Um, uh, so I'm, I've become a little bit of a farmer here. But I, I, uh, what I said again, and I've said it many times, and I think it's one of the, one of the things that I want to leave behind, the, the motto of that best farmer competition and the harvest money expo that is that is linked to it is, is farming is a business um, and a farmer is a businessman or a businesswoman and I'd like to extend that a little bit not just to farming but to 
to many other areas in, in society and in the economy. Um, Uganda is one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world in the sense of many young people start a business, partly out of necessity because there are no jobs, but if we can, if we can um, uh, unpack that potential of all these entrepreneurial spirits in this country, uh, I think the country has a great future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Heng. Well, uh, when, very when two great men speak, sometimes you don't even know what to add. Um, the words of wisdom uh, from uh, Sheikh Mohammed were really encouraging, calling for capacity building. I hope the members of parliament uh, can take that home and maybe while in parliament, they think about capacity building for religious leaders to involve them in these development programs that we're always talking about. And of course, something interesting uh, from Ambassador Heng, uh, talking about um, embracing farming. I believe if we are to reduce the dependency rate in this country, there is need to embrace farming because it's the backbone of this nation. Where I come from in Kunji district, 90% of the population are farmers and majority are in rural areas. So if you do not embrace farming, it definitely means the dependency rate will keep very, very high in this country. So at this moment, there's someone very, very vocal, very, very important, uh, the country director of CODAID, um, Ms. Petra. I'll uh, ask one of my colleagues uh, from NTV to help us uh, get the microphone to you. Uh, why I am uh, singling her out in particular, before we get back to our panel, when there was the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, they, come, they came to the alliance and approached us and said, how can, we ref uh, how can we work together to ensure that the challenge that young people are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic can be addressed? We, work, we are working on a project with them, with Reproductive Health Uganda, with uh, Reach Hand Uganda, and with the uh, UNIPA, that's Uganda Network of Young People uh, Living with HIV AIDS. So I, I, w w you can tell us wha what more is Kodei doing to respond to the challenges young people are facing. I would not want to be the one to talk about them, but since you're the ones that responded, what more is Kodei doing to respond to the uh, SRHR challenges that young people are facing during the lockdown, and where are the gaps? The fact that we have here some people from the government and the parliament, you never know some of those gaps could be addressed. Thank you, Ms. Petra. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. And uh, it has been very inspirational to listen to, to each of you and hearing like the, the policy challenges and also the individual stories and see how they can be connected. And um, well, before really answering your questions, and um, I would like to say we are facing a worldwide global crisis and it's not only uh, affecting uh, like the, the direct COVID diseases, but uh, health issues in general. It's affecting human rights, it's affecting social issues, economic, uh, all these things coming together. And what you see is each country is, uh, is uh, trying to find the right balance. If you press on this button, it will have effect on that one. And how do you find the right balance in each country? And uh, I'm quite impressed by how Uganda is doing, especially on preventing COVID and at the same time concerned on what will be, be the consequences, the social consequences. Children, yeah, adolescents not going to school. It was mentioned this morning, like uh, youth corners are closed. Um, it was said like we need access to health services. I would like to say ad uh, adolescents uh, seeking for, for SRHR services, they are not sick people, they are healthy people. So let's also make sure, let's, let's look at the power of these people and, and, and make sure that they, their, their needs can be addressed, not only in the health facilities, but also outside these health facilities. And if there's one thing that this uh, adolescents and the youth in Uganda deserve, then it's uh, collaboration, coordination, and joint efforts from uh, policies, implementing policies, making sure we work together with the donors, making sure we partners work together and coordinate our actions. If we need, uh, we do not only meet, need more financial meet, but means, but also better use of them. Let's make sure that with uh, efficient, efficient use of financial resources, we make sure we can make a difference. So these adolescents, they have a future. And, um, they are facing many challenges, but also working with uh, the SRHR Alliance, with Reach and Uganda, with all the different partners. Um, I'm impressed by by the energy young people can can generate. 
uh, the partners, but also the adolescents, listening to the various stories, they are so resilient and powerful. So they do not only face challenges, but also we can make much better use of, of, uh, of, their, of their power. And one of the things we are doing in our collaboration is working with the youth as youth ambassadors. It sounds maybe simple, but it's so important because they have an important role to play in their communities, in the society. And that's one of the things we are doing in, in our project we are working together on. We are trying to, to find a combination in addressing direct challenges of COVID response. And at the same time, we are working on um, on, on the building blocks for the longer term. How can we make sure that the system, the health system, uh, continues to be strengthened? How can we make sure that um, uh, that access to other health services, adolescent services, remain continued? Um, and making, making sure that we are using uh, technologies. Has so if we cannot have physical meetings, how do we make sure that these landlines uh, uh, are working, that at least uh, adolescents have access to to uh, uh, to helplines where they can get get some of the necessary support. Um, so these are some of the things we are we are doing. And again, I think the most important thing is that we collaborate and make sure that we together create an impact and come through this crisis even stronger. And I think it was already said, uh, like like it's uh, we are learning from this crisis, and let's make sure that we also use it as an, as an opportunity opportunity and come stronger out of this. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much, Miss Petra. Indeed, that's a take home. We need to come out of this crisis stronger than we are. Uh, before uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, of air and we are li about to open our discussion to the rest of the audience, but also to remind you that you're watching us live on NTV Uganda, and this is an e conference on World Population Day. On the 13th, Uganda will be joining the rest of the world to celebrate the World Population Day. So, as an, uh, as an alliance that works directly, with young people, so the sexual reproductive health. That's why we organize this, to make sure we join the rest of the world. We work with government, we support government. The theme for this e-conference is uh, building Uganda's population resilience, investing in young people's sexual reproductive health. That is the reason we are actually discussing young people. That's the reason why young people have given their perspective of the challenges they are facing right now in the pandemic. So our call to government, to development partners, to everyone here is to invest in young people to build Uganda's resilience. To you, James, to open the discussion to the rest of the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Navasa, for this very good time that we've so far had. We appreciate. We are opening up to have a wider discussion. For the people that are watching us on TV and online, uh, this uh, dialogue will continue at 1 to 3 p.m. on Uganda's biggest network, UBC. So for Honorable Akelo, the people of Otuke should know that you're on TV. And uh, for our online audiences, our social media handles are all on, and we encourage you to follow the hashtag WPD2020. Thank you very much, and I would love to now go to the audience to hear your thoughts about what we've so far discussed. Make your key recommendations for us to capture, and keep following up. We are learning that there is a new ambassador joining the Dutch Embassy. Of course, we shall take these new recommendations to them if they are part of uh, the recommendation list. And to the new members of Parliament, I'm assuming my honorable is definitely one of them. We have a good starting point with these new recommendations. The CSOs, we are always looking for the money. So these recommendations should shape where we put the money. And from the Mufti, I can't have any bigger learning from today. Our money should go there. Our money should go there. The young people, I'm also going to come back to you to make further recommendations. So at this moment, I would love to open the floor. Please, uh, the person with the microphone, you can help us to move. Feel free to make a contribution based on where you are. If you feel you have a question, you have a statement to add, please feel free. It can be someone from the panel. Anyone, feel free anyone. to add something. Uh, if you're watching us on TV, you can also do the same mm -hmm. online on our Twitter handle. Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance, and we definitely get to respond to those. So, yeah, the shake. Uh, okay. Well, as uh, we await for our listeners and uh, those who are watching us, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you my old man who is here with me, Sheikh Suleiman Ogera, is my maternal uncle but uh, most precisely my teacher 
one in primary one. You can see the care is taking of me <laughs> up to now. <laughs> and this is the, <laughs> the train that we are seeking. The, my mother passed on, but she took the role to look after me. So thank you for allowing me to introduce him. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, good to introduce elders. Anyone that has something to add, Myra, do you have anything to add? You represent the young people, so definitely you have to be that vocal voice that they need. Thank you so much, Innocent and Gems. Um, and I want to also thank so much the panelists that have brought out issues that are really speaking to the issues that we're facing as young people. And um, we have a few asks as young people that we think should move away from the conversation on this panel from Serena and go to implementation in the community. And like I've said, I know we've had these things maybe in different spaces, but the question, like we said, maybe we need an implementation minister, like the ambassador said. So we need to move away from the theoretical conversation and actualize these things into our communities. And the first and foremost from, from young people to the government, we want the, uh, the government to ensure that young people have representation on the health unit management committees. We realize that these committees make decisions of what is going to happen at these health facilities where young people access services. So we want these young people to be represented so that they ensure the impartiality of youth-friendly services, but also that activities that happen at the health facility are inclusive of all young people of all diversity. Secondly, we want the Ministry of Health to recognize and utilize the youth networks that I, and community structures that have been very supportive during this COVID-19. We've seen peers delivering uh, at treatment to their fellows. We've seen peers trying to reach out to give out condoms, but these are not recognized by the Ministry of Health. But now COVID-19 exposes us that we need to empower those youth networks to be able to be the champions to ensure that there is improved access to services and information by young people. Um, we want Ministry of Education as young people to issue directive to schools to allow girls after giving birth, especially these girls that have unintended pregnancy, to go back to school and study. Because like the, 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 the Honourable Member of Parliament said, it doesn't mean that when I, I get pregnant, it's the end of my future. I still have a dream. So we need the Ministry of Education to take an initiative to issue this directive. As young people, furthermore, we want the government to get these policies off the shelves and implement them. We want the sexuality education framework to roll out to the most rural communities of Uganda and also support the local structures to disseminate in the local languages so that this is something that everyone can consume. Furthermore, we want the government to pass the national school health policy. How are we going to ensure the safety of our children, of our young people, if we do not pass this so that by the time schools open, they have a guideline to, to follow to ensure that young people are safe. And we want the government to develop a national level program that focuses on mentorship of young people to empower them with necessary skills required to competently participate in decision-making boards. Most of the time we're talking about meaningful uh, participation representation. And then we put young people in spaces when they're not yet competent to represent others. So we need an initiative by the government to ensure that these young people are capacity strengthened to, to be competent and represent others effectively. We also need the government. We already know the government is doing enough. I mean, it's doing something to uh, uh, empower us economically as young people, but we need the government to scale up these programs and reach all sorts of young people in the community so that we are all in a diversity, empowered economically to support ourselves, but also our young families. Furthermore, we need the rollout of the parenting guideline. Parents are ignorant on how to handle issues of sexuality education, of, se of reproductive health of their adolescents. So we need the Ministry of Gender to roll out this parenting guideline to support parents on how to handle issues of young people. We also, like uh, Dr. Chadondo said, we have 50% of Uganda's population below 15 years. What does this speak to us? We as a country, we need to, because when we look at the sexual debut of Uganda, for girls it's about 15 years, and then for 
men, for boys it's 16. So if we do not lower the constant edge of accessing family planning for these young people, remember some of them don't have the best relationship with their parents. So how do you expect a parent to consent to something that is supposed to happen to my body? So we need to look into actualizing this to what is really happening in a country. And um, last but not least, I want us, I want the government to go further and engage the boys in these programs. Because when we empower women to be able to support themselves, to stand for themselves, here we are, there was something that was making grounds that as you're teaching girls how to take care of themselves, how to uh, protect themselves from these kinds of issues that come across them, the boy is playing video games. And this is the same boy she's going to meet and they have a conversation as adolescents and what happens next. This is when we see the teenage pregnancies, that's when we see the STIs, we see the unsafe abortions. So as a country, we need to move forward and stop having conversations around these issues and indeed implement to build the resilience of Uganda by investing in the sexual productive health and rights uh, of young people. Thank you so much for good and my country. Thank you very much. I would love to go to Hindu to hear what she has to say as we close this. And we shall go off air. I think that's okay. Yeah, we shall uh, actually in about, uh, about right now, actually. I think it's the moment where we get to say uh, goodbye to our TV audience, people watching us on uh, uh, NTV Uganda this moment. We've been having a conversation, I could say a dialogue on uh, World Population Day. And we are talking about Uganda's population. And we are talking about the need to invest in Uganda's young population, the need to invest in young people, the need to invest in the sexual reproductive health and rights of young people if government is to harness the set demographic dividends. So that is our take home today. And uh, I like the fact that young people have passionately spoken. And for the people that have been following us on NTV Uganda, thank you so much. You can still watch us on UBC TV. Uh, that will be from uh, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Talking about the same discussion, even when we get off TV, we shall continue with the discussion. So you can still follow the discussion on Facebook. The hashtag is WPD2020UG, or you can follow us uh, on the Alliance platform, SRHR Alliance Uganda. For now, thank you for watching. The conversation still goes on. So to you, Hindu.